Martin. This is show number 31 for Governor John Bell Edwards. He's been doing this since April of 2016. And of course, we're now two and a half years removed from the premiere. And for the next hour, if you'd like to talk to the governor, 877-217-5757. That's your number, 877-217-5757, toll free, wherever you are in Louisiana or beyond. And the governor has been on the road today. Good Afternoon, Governor John well, thank Bell. Thank you. It's great to be back with you, Jim. And, and yeah, we went up to Shreveport this morning and had a great morning up there with uh, two uh, events. One, we cut the ribbon on uh, a section of I-49, so we can now mm-hmm. say that I-49 uh, will travels uh, from the Arkansas state line in the north to LA, I mean, to Interstate 10 in the south. Um, and we cut the ribbon on the last 142 million dollar segment there. Uh, which folks I can tell you in the Shreveport, Bossier area are very excited about, and they should be. That's that's quite a, um, a feat, and, and uh, very happy that we were able to go up there and do that this morning. We also had a press conference with the sheriff to announce our, our criminal justice reinvestment uh, in the Caddo reentry program of just shy of a million dollars uh, to um, really shore up and improve the reentry services that we provide to give those prisoners a better chance of being successful upon reentry, uh, and Sheriff Prater's been providing um, a reentry uh, program up there for a long time, and that, so that's that's critically important. You know, we saved about twelve point two million dollars um, over last year over the mm-hmm. criminal justice. We're reinvesting seventy percent of that, about eight point four million total, and rather than spread it out all over the state, what we try to do on the reentry side, we're focusing on the five parishes that are responsible for almost fifty percent of our inmates, because that's where we can have the most impact. Uh, and I think if we spread uh, the money too thinly, we wouldn't have uh, the impact that we would want to have. Uh, so we're going to also do similar um, reinvestments in East Baton Rouge, Orleans Parish, Jefferson Parish, and St. Tammany. And then as the savings continue to accrue, uh, we will then expand beyond those parishes. So today has been a good day and, and uh, happy to be here with you and to look forward to answering some questions. Let's start... Uh in Longview, Texas, James, uh, who's a frequent uh, visitor to Ask the Governor. James, good afternoon. You're on the air with Governor John Bell Edwards. Well, good afternoon, Jim, and hello, Governor Edwards. Good afternoon, and thank you for calling again, James. Anyhow, I'm glad to hear you. It's raining cats and dogs here in Longview, uh, Texas, so I'm glad to talk to you. And I, I commend you on the I-49 thing. I, I like that. So anyhow, my question is, I recently read where you went out to Hollywood to drum up uh, support for Louisiana's tax breaks and incentive for TV programs and films to be made in Louisiana. And I'd simply like to know the reaction you got out there in California. Do you think that there's more uh, studios that are show more interest in Louisiana and in filming in the future. Well, James, again, thank you for the call. And the short answer is yes, I do. We we were very well received. Uh, over two days, we visited with eight different studios, uh, some of the mainline studios that you've certainly heard of and, and others like uh, Hulu and Netflix, which are also mm-hmm. creating original content now. But we went to CBS and um, NBC, and, and so it, it, was a, it was a great trip. Uh, I will tell you, we were very well received. They like being in Louisiana. Um, there's something uh, about uh, our state that they, they really like. Uh, and, and coming down here and, and filming uh, feature films and, and uh, also TV series. And uh, I wanted to go and make sure that they understood uh, what the uh, Motion Picture Investor Tax Credit Program offers them. Uh, and they were well aware. They, they've been following what we've done in Louisiana. In 2017, we revamped the program to maximize the return on investment to the state of Louisiana, uh, to cap it uh, so that so that we won't certify more than $150 million in credits in any year, because several years before that, um, there was well over $200 million worth of tax credits that were being applied for. So we reduced the cost of the program. We made sure that we maximized the return on the investment they were getting. They were going to develop an indigenous workforce and industry here in Louisiana. Um, and and we also have a sunset of 2025. So just make sure that they know that we're committed to the program and the stability. Uh, and we were well received and I, I fully expect, you know, right now we actually have 13 productions in Louisiana. It was 21 at the, at the beginning of the year, 13 now, which is a big number. Um, and I expect that that's going to grow uh, over time because there's so much more original content being created now than there used to be. 
Um, and Louisiana is, is well positioned, I think, to take advantage of that. And we have people who've invested in this industry all across the state of Louisiana, and it, it produces uh, more tourism. We, we, we know, and, and we're, in fact, there's going to be a new economic impact study on this tax credit program that comes out this next spring. Uh, but we know that, that motion pictures and TV series that identify uh, Louisiana sites, you know, for example, NCIS New Orleans yeah. generates a, a lot of uh, tourism uh, for the state of Louisiana. So it's not just the impact of the feature film or the, the TV production itself. It's the tourism that it draws and, and related uh, economic impact. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the study. But we, we were well received, James, and I think we will have more uh, productions taking place in Louisiana as a result. Ralph in Baton Rouge. Hello, Ralph. You're on the air with the governor. Hello, Governor. Hi, Ralph. Uh, what I'm what I'm calling about is that I had an issue. Of course, this happened before you became the governor. Uh, the Department of uh, the Department of Hospital, Department of Elder Affairs. So, I had a relative of my my mother, uh, and I was having a lot of trouble with someone who was taking care of it. Wasn't doing a good job, and uh, she passed uh, the 18th of, la- of uh, October of last year. And that department, we tried. We wrote letters. We wrote letters. We wrote letters. They wrote their letters. They don't write them a letter anymore. And the person ended up dying, my mother ended up dying on October 18th of 2017, at about 50 pounds, covered with bed sores. All right. Well, Ralph, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. And I know it's been a year, but it never gets easy to think about or talk about the passing of a loved one, especially one's mother. Uh, obviously, I don't know the details uh, around your particular situation, but before you get off the phone, I want you to give Micah your, your phone number and a summary of the information uh, that you have and the request that you have, um, because I'm I'm not quite sure where you were you were going with that, uh, but I will get that information, and then you will hear from someone within the administration who I believe is is best situated to to call and and talk to you and 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 uh, just you know explore this matter further. We're about to go to a break, but Governor, you um, this is asked. Well, there we go. You uh, you're back from a trip to Colorado. I am. We, we had a great trip. So it was the third straight year that I've done that in the middle of October, the, the opening of rifle season for elk. And, uh, and this year, there was, the difference was I was able to take my son, John Miller, who's okay. 16. Great trip. Friday is another uh, crucial deadline regarding the Restore survey. What uh, will be taking place in two days? Well, what, what happens is the Congress um, was taking up a bill that would potentially – uh, give us some relief on the duplication of benefits. Uh, and so that provision was preventing us uh, from being able to extend grant money to homeowners who had taken small business administration loans or qualified for small business administration loans um, as a matter of federal law. Well, Congress passed a law. Uh, the president signed it. The day he signed it, I submitted a letter to him asking him to issue a waiver, which the law requires, of that duplication of benefits provision. Um, assuming that he does grant the waiver, uh, we wanted to make sure that individuals in Louisiana had more Mm -hmm. time uh, to fill out the survey. And so we opened the survey period to this Friday, October the 19th. Uh, Since we reopened it, 1,736 homeowners have taken the survey, um, and they have until Friday to do so. And and I'm going to encourage everyone who received damage to their home and hasn't taken the survey yet uh, with the Restore program to go to restore.la.gov, restore.la.gov, or they can call 1-866-735-2001 from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. 866-735-2001. The survey takes up less than 15 minutes, uh, and then if you potentially qualify for assistance, you will be invited to apply. The application deadline uh, for this group has also been extended till November the 16th. Um, we believe that assistance is coming, so the president's going to have to sign the waiver. HUD is then, then going to have to issue some guidance or some rules uh, so that we can then uh, it, take advantage of this relief that we've been given. But if homeowners don't take the survey, uh, they're not going to be able to participate. So I'm encouraging everyone uh, to do that uh, immediately. Ryan at LSU. Ryan, good afternoon. You're on Ask the Governor with Governor Edwards. Good afternoon, Governor Edwards. I have a question regarding... Um, being a pro-life Democrat in the state of Louisiana, I just I'm wondering how do you reconcile um, existing as a pro-life Democrat uh, in this state? And speaking of pro-life, what is your uh, solid stance on the death penalty? All right. So Ryan, um, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm, 
understand that you were questioning about uh, me being a pro-life Democrat, which obviously I'm very proud uh, to do that. In fact, I received the first ever uh, Casey Award uh, that was given in 2016 uh, nationally uh, to a Democrat who is to his pro-life. It's easy for me. I mean, that's that's the way I was raised. That's what my Catholic Christian faith requires. Um, and so I am pro-life. Uh, and, and, you know, there are a whole range of issues, um, and, and rarely do two people, regardless of party, agree on every single issue. Uh, and so it, it's, just, it's just not difficult for me at all. I, I know that uh, for many in the national uh, party or on the national scene, that's not a good fit. But I will tell you, here in Louisiana, uh, I speak and meet with uh, Democrats who are pro-life every single day. And so, so it, it, it comes pretty easy for me. Um, and with respect to, and by the way, that's one of the reasons why the Medicaid expansion was such an obvious thing for me to do is because I believe that that too is pro-life. When you have working poor people with health care coverage uh, and they can receive diagnostic evaluations and primary care and find out that they have diseases earlier, for example, and then they get treatment for diseases, they get an opportunity to live uh, and to stay productive in the workforce. And so that's, that's an extension of that same uh, pro-life view. One of those positions, you know, for example, on abortion is considered conservative. On Medicaid expansion, it's considered liberal, but it both comes from the same. They both come from mm -hmm. the same place, and so that that's why th this is not an easy uh, uh, issue to pigeonhole people, or, or especially me on at, at least, uh, because I don't think the labels uh, really work. He also asked about the death penalty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and Ryan, I've addressed that before on this program as well. You know, when when I took an oath to of the oath of office, um, it it said that I supported the the laws of the state and the constitution of our state. Uh, that happens to be one of the laws, and and you know it prescribes uh, uh, the death penalty for certain or can be imposed for certain offenses, and then prescribes a manner in which it can be uh, imposed. And and so consistent with that oath of office, um, that that is I do support those laws that are currently in place. Kim in Cottonport. Kim, good afternoon. You're on Ask the Governor. Uh, yes, Governor. I'm a community pharmacist in rural Louisiana. Yes, ma'am. And I guess I'm just reaching out to you in a desperate plea for help um, with the pharmacy benefit managers and how they are affecting our ability to take care of our patients. And it seems like everywhere we turn um, from politicians to government officials, uh, we're just hit with roadblock after roadblock because the matter is so complicated. And while everybody's trying to understand the situation, we're just left on the front lines not being able to take care of the patients. And it's really, really affecting ca patient care and access. And I was just hoping you could give us some shred of hope. Well, thank you, Kim, uh, for calling. I know that recently... Um, there was a legislative hearing to consider oversight of a rule uh, that had been issued by the pharmacy board that was going to require uh, PBMs to be more uh, strictly regulated, I believe even licensed. Um, the uh, legislature, uh, the committees, the Joint uh, Senate and House uh, Health um, uh, and Welfare Committees, I think rejected the rule. If I'm not mistaken, the House voted for it, uh, but the Senate a majority of the senators present present did not, um, and so that's that's one of the things we're going to explore uh, because the legislature did pass a bill last year uh, dealing with PBMs as well. Uh, but it's something that I understand that most pharmacists would support uh, because the way PBMs are operating, um, that they are acting in many cases like a pharmacist with all of the rules that they that they uh, make a pharmacist follow in in terms of which drugs can be. Um, uh, given out uh, in, in accordance with, with certain prescriptions and, and, and so forth. And so we'll, we'll continue to work on that, and, and I'm, I haven't had an opportunity yet uh, to meet with the um, uh, Senator Mills, who, who chairs the Senate uh, Health and Welfare Committee, or Frank Hoffman from Monroe, West Monroe, I should say, who chairs the House Committee. But we're going to do that and see, see how we need to move forward. Thank you, Kim. Carolyn in Plaquemine. Carolyn, good afternoon. You're on Ask the Governor. Hi there. Um, Governor, my question has to do with, um, in regards to the Sunshine Bridge closure that just recently got hit yes, by the uh, crane on a barge. 
Yes, ma'am. I'm sure you're aware of. Um, DOTD has, has stated that a ferry can't be set up in White Castle due to lengthy Army Corps of Engineer and Coast Guard permits. Um, my question is, what's the alternative evacuation route for us as we're sitting in ducks here in Iberville Parish surrounded by plants? And um, and why doesn't this fall under emergency management to expedite these per- these permits, considering we've already had three explosions and a shelter in place within the last 12 months? Carolyn, thank you for the call. And, and I can tell you that uh, uh, DOTD did issue, um, Secretary Wilson using the authority that he has, he did uh, declare an emergency so that he could issue a contract for the repairs uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, I was able to look at some drone video footage of the damage. It is extensive. It is more extensive than than most people, I think, realize. Uh, initially, the plan was was going to be to allow two-way traffic on one side of the bridge, and then they realized that, that you, we can't even allow that. Um, and so they're moving forward as, as quickly as possible to get the bridge repaired. Um, I met with uh, Dr. Wilson today, the Secretary of DOTD. He tells me, it's it's not days or weeks it's it's going to be months we're looking at every option we have to expedite the flow of traffic so on monday they evaluated traffic flow by monday night they devised um, a plan to change signals to position law enforcement officers direct traffic in order to to get traffic moving as, as quickly as possible still not a great situation but it was much better yesterday i haven't gotten a report on today with respect to the, the ferries, the, that's really not m- a great solution uh, because you can only carry a couple of hundred vehicles mm-hmm. a day, uh, and you have about 30,000 uh, that were using the bridge. And, and so we, we doubled the ferry at Plaquemines, so we, we'd moved an extra ferry into Plaquemines. And so I would encourage those people in the, in the uh, White, Coast, White Castle area, which is, I think, the, the town that you mentioned, um, if they want to use a ferry to try to get up to Plaquemines in order to do that. But we don't, we don't have another ferry to put in White mm-hmm. Castle. Even if we had everything else lined up, we don't have a ferry right now that we could put there. 877-217-5757 is your number for Ask the Governor and John in Baton Rouge. Hello, John. Hello, oh, Governor. I got uh, kind of a two-part, two questions here. Yes, sir. Uh, one, of course, uh, I, I don't hear the word Comey River Diversion Project enough, and uh, I just kind of wanted to hear uh, what uh, I heard something about January. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure where you, where you get the well, – first of all, get, go ahead and give me the second part of your question because I see Jim's finger hit the <laughs> button. So go ahead and give me the second part, then I'll address it. The, the second question is our LSU pond – I'm sorry, LSU lakes – about 40 years ago, they drained them and dredged them out. The other day, I was on a, a two-by-four, and I got stuck over in front of the Lod Cook Center on a rock. Uh, <laughs> so that might tell you that our LSU lakes are, you know, they're inches deep. Well, f- the, the second part first. I, the LSU lakes uh, are, are silted in, and there's no doubt about that. They are shallower than, than you, anyone would want them to be. We are exploring funding options now to try to um, dredge uh, those lakes. Uh, we, we do have some money that may be available, actually, from the BP spill, uh, and, and, but you would have to do it in a way that would allow a migratory uh, waterfowl, for example, uh, to better use the lakes. And, and we're looking at that because we have some, some funding that can only be used on those types of projects. Uh, and, and so we are taking a look at that, and I will tell you, the Baton Rouge Area Foundation under John Spain has really been promoting uh, the restoration of those LSU lakes. Uh, it, is a, it is an expensive project, however, and it, it wasn't one that I could justify uh, given how resource-constrained we were um, and really continue to be, but things are much better now than, than, than they were. With respect to the Comet River Diversion Project, the good news is that Congress appropriated $1.4 billion to the Corps of Engineers that has to be spent in Louisiana uh, to mitigate against flood risks of, in those areas that were damaged by floods in 2016. Uh, as, as a result of that, we have been successful in getting the Corps uh, to commit with White House approval now, with Office of Management and Budget approval, to, um, to do the Comete River Diversion Project completely on its own dime. Uh, and we are working, DOTD is working with the Corps 
to expedite the, the project and actually move it forward as, as quickly as possible uh, now. And, and so that, that is the good news because up until now, I know that it's been decades in the making, uh, but up until now, all of the funding has never been in place. But that is not true so we now, any longer. We now have the funding, and we are, we're going to be moving forward as quickly as possible, which I think will be of great benefit to the folks uh, in, in northern Baton Rouge, uh, but also it, south, uh, because the, even the, the floodwaters uh, that, that reach down into the southern parts of Baton Rouge should be uh, not quite as deep. Uh, going forward, if we can, once we get the the Comet River diversion uh, done, as mentioned, next month it'll be November fourteenth that we will spend some time with the governor instead of November twenty first. And between now and then, there are midterm elections, and uh, governor, the prognosis uh, forecast here is that we'll have about twenty percent turnout, maybe a bit more. But if it's thirty percent, that's still not a good number. That is not a good number, and this is a, there's a special election for Secretary of State, mm-hmm. uh, and we have um, each member of Congress is, is, is up for, for uh, election. Then you've got also got uh, other races, whether it's up in Shreveport, uh, where you have the mayor and the commission and so forth. Uh, you have school board members running across the state. So I, I would hope, and I'm encouraging uh, people to get out and vote. Uh, I'm also encouraging them to be an informed voter, and so spend the time between now and then, because as you know, um, uh, early voting is going to be here very soon, uh, but so spend time between now and, and early voting or b- between now and Election Day, uh, study the candidates, the issues, and, and, um, and look at the constitutional amendments that are going to be voted on and, and, and go out and vote and, and cast an informed uh, ballot. Uh, I, th- I think it's critically important. You know, it, it is a sad statement when you when you actually have a turnout of 25 or 30 mm-hmm. percent in an election like this. And I know that's what's being forecasted, and I just hope the forecast proved to be wrong. Well, nationally, uh, two years ago, it was only 56 percent for the presidential election. Why do you think there's so much apathy? You know, I, I, I don't know. I guess there are certain people who think that, that no matter how they vote, it won't really make a difference. And I reject that. I think, I think uh, voting is important, and I think elections have consequences. Um, you know, the other thing is, I, I believe that we ha- may have a higher percentage of eligible voters who are actually registered now, but that just because you register doesn't mean that you are mm-hmm. uh, interested enough um, that you're actually going to go out and vote. And so the, the percentage of, of the voter rolls that actually participates, it actually gets smaller, even though you might have about the same level of participation as you had uh, before overall. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but, but there is no real defense to that i mean it's it's just it's unacceptable that 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 so many people uh for whatever reason choose not to vote because voting is easier than it ever used to be in addition to election day you've got uh, seven days of early voting uh and and if you're not going to be here you can vote by mail mm-hmm. so so they're just it, it's easier than it's ever been i hope people will take advantage of the opportunity uh and exercise their right to vote it's homecoming at one of your uh, two alma maters. LSU plays Mississippi State Saturday, and then in two weeks, the University of Alabama comes to town with yeah. number you one You know, team. I, for obviously, I'm excited about the Alabama game, but I'm really hopeful that the team is not looking past Mississippi State, and I don't think they will be because Mississippi State uh, beat us pretty soundly last year, mm-hmm. and I was up at that game, and and the reason that game is so important to me is Donna's family are all Mississippi State people. Really, They'll be here with me this weekend. Um, and I am not <laughs> interested in hosting them for the weekend and bringing them to the game uh, and having uh, Mississippi State uh, beat LSU. I, you know, so I, I'm, I'm, I believe LSU is going to play well this weekend. I think they're excited. Uh, they saw how well they can play last mm-hmm. week. And because State beat us uh, last year, I, there's no way they're going to look past State towards Alabama. But but uh, assuming we beat Mississippi State this weekend, that game against Alabama is just going to be awesome. That that uh, I, I think the atmosphere is going to mm-hmm. be electric. Uh, you know it's going to be a, a capacity crowd. Uh, I think they've already announced it's a night game, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's going to be a tremendous uh, game. And and but. But again, I'm I'm doing what I don't want the team doing. I don't want to look past <laughs> Mississippi State uh, towards uh, towards Alabama. Since we last talked, uh, there's been a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth over holistic admission standards. Yeah, and, and you know I, I think it's unfortunate, uh, and and I, I, 
it's be much better for the state, I think, if you didn't have all this playing out in the media, but you actually had higher education leaders sitting down and talking to one another, whether it's the Board of Regents and, and the LSU Board, whether it's the Commissioner of Higher Education and the System President for LSU, um, to talk through this. Because sometimes I think that, that there's, there's been miscommunication um, about what, what's really happening and, and so forth. And then anytime you get one, uh, you know, the LSU president questioning the authority of the Board of Regents um, to, to enforce a policy that has it adopted, I, I think you, it's just unfortunate. We, we can do better than that, and, and, um, and I am, I'm working to make sure that, um, that we get on the same page. Uh, and so I've, I've had conversations with the president of LSU and with the commissioner of higher education, uh, and some board members from both the Board of Regents and the LSU Board of Supervisors, uh, because we have to we have to do better. And by the way, if you if you listen to the explanation for why we should have um, holistic admissions process, they seem rather um, uh, genuine and sincere. Uh, you've got highly qualified students who who may come from a different state, but because their core curriculum mm -hmm. is different than ours, they may require an exception. Um, you also have individuals in certain parts of our state who may not have access to a foreign language because they come from a parish that doesn't offer it in all of their high schools. Well, that shouldn't be a barrier if otherwise that kid is eligible uh, to be at LSU. And then we also know that, that there are individuals who go to schools, I'm sorry, I should say come from families, and they're going to take the ACT once. Uh, because they don't have uh, the the financial wherewithal to mm -hmm. to take it multiple times and pay out of their own pocket, and and so they may come up a little bit shy. But if their grade point average suggests that they will be successful, and you look at more information around the student, then I think it may be appropriate to allow that student in. But these conversations need to be taking place b between regents and LSU, and, and actually, I guess between regents and all of our systems. Uh, so that if there is a better way to um, govern the admissions process today than was in the case 20 years ago, and we can learn from the experience mm -hmm. of other states, we ought to be sitting down and doing that collaboratively and not playing this out in the press the way it's, it's being played out. That's, that's unfortunate, mm -hmm. and, and we, we need to do better. We're going to do better. Now, what's going on here is tame compared to what's happening in other parts of our country. The, the president uh, has called a a fellow citizen, horse face, another yeah. one a dog. Um, yeah. And, what, what do you think? Well, you know, I think that's unfortunate, too. And, and really, and, and this isn't just the president. I think if you look at, at, at uh, what's on the news at night, whether it's elected officials or whether it's uh, uh, pundits and, and consultants mm -hmm. who get brought in, whether it's CNN or whatever, the political discourse is far too uncivil these days. And, and we need to do a better job because we are modeling that behavior for our kids, and we ought to do better. Um, and and I, you were talking about voter apathy. Mm -hmm. This might drive that. You know, it, it might exacerbate that, make it worse. If you just see everybody on on both sides of the political spectrum engaging in this sort of of um, you know talk, I think it it turns off people. And and so we we need to do better. And also, since we last visited, uh, that we've had, we've got a new Supreme Court justice. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed uh, to succeed Anthony Kennedy on the High Court, but not without a, a intense fight that involved uh, a lot of discussion about uh, alleged past transgressions. What does that do uh, to the process and to uh, the ability of Judge Justice Kavanaugh to uh, sit on the court effectively? Yeah, you know, first of all, yeah, he's a Supreme Court justice, his vote's going to count, and so I, I don't know that it's going to have any long-term lasting impact uh, in that respect. But what we missed, I think, and, and what you would have seen a, at least a decade or two ago, is a group of senators, uh, both Republican and Democrat, but, but mostly in the center, who would just come together and say, you know what, this isn't going to play out this way. We're not going to tear the country up. We're, we're going we're gonna to stick together. We're going we're gonna to figure out a way through this that isn't going to damage either the Supreme Court as an institution or the country. Uh, and, and But that, that never happened um, th this time. And I think it, it speaks to how we, we don't really have the, the moderates uh, in both parties who come together. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're paying a price for that. And it would, we would be better off, not just on the Supreme Court issues, but on, on many, many issues if we had those, those folks who could come together in the center. Monica in Marksville. Hello, Monica. You're on with Governor Edwards. 
Good afternoon, Governor Edwards. Hi, Monica. I am calling. You got a question earlier about the PBMs regulating and the Express Scripts. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my husband and I are um, Express Scripts customers, and I'm calling to see. I heard you say y'all were going to look into it, but how long is that? Well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how long it's going to take. What what I was saying is that there was some legislation that actually got passed this past year dealing with PBMs. We know that the Board of Pharmacy promulgated a rule, and then the Joint uh, um, Senate and House uh, Health and Welfare Committee meeting, uh, uh, providing oversight over the rule, a majority of the Senate members did not vote in favor of the rule, which would have basically... Uh, required PBMs, as I understand it, to have been licensed as a pharmacist because of the way they were operating. Um, and so we're going to be sitting down uh, with uh, the at least the chairs of the House and Senate committees and, and other folks to talk about wh whether that's an effort that needs to be, uh, you know, brought back up again or whether it needs to be revised uh, moving forward in some way because because there does seem to be a growing issue with uh, the way PBMs are operating, not just in our state but nationwide. The governor, uh, is noted, will be with us uh, four weeks from today, but between now and then much will ha is happening, not only Alabama and LSU and the midterm elections, but you'll be going to Israel. I am. Uh, so Donna and I, we're, we're going to be about 24 people strong. Uh, we're going to go on the 26th of October, come back on the 2nd of November, I uh, spent a couple days in Jerusalem and then uh, I think three days in Tel Aviv. Uh, and this is, this is a being done uh, in conjunction with the National Governors Association around cybersecurity. I'm the co-chair uh, of cybersecurity uh, efforts in the National Governors Association, uh, along with Rick Schneider of, of Michigan. Um, but uh, Israel really is the leading country in the world when it comes to cybersecurity and exporting uh, products and so forth. It's, it's very important here in Louisiana. We have the Cyber Innovation Center in Bossier. We have Barksdale Air Force Base. We, we have the need to uh, make sure that our, our government computers are, are safe and, and protect data from people, but also um, private sector, uh, and, and, and whether it's businesses or individuals. And so that's a huge part of what we're doing when we go over there. But we're also going to be bringing, uh, of the 24 people, more than half, or, yeah, more than half will, will actually be private sector. So we're going to talk about energy. Uh, and try to get uh, the Israeli companies to engage Louisiana companies when they explore for oil and gas in the Mediterranean, which they're doing more now more than ever before. We're also going to talk about water management. We're going to bring individuals from, um, from the uh, Water Institute here in, in Baton Rouge. Uh, we, we're also going to bring folks from higher education. We're going to talk logistics because the Port of New Orleans does a lot of business with uh, an Israeli shipping company and so forth. But this is a trade mission. It's also... Um, being done at the request of the Consulate General for the Southwest Louisiana. He actually uh, is out of Texas. Um, and so we have a visit with Prime Minister Netanyahu and also uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and Minister of Energy. Uh, and so it's, it's going to be a great trip. Um, looking forward to it. And, and I believe it's going to produce a lot of results for the state of Louisiana. 877-217-5757, Tyler and Lafayette. Hello, Tyler. You're on the air with the governor. Hi. How are you doing? Hi, Tyler. Uh, it's nice. Very nice to talk to you, sir. I read your father's book. It was great. Um, or the book about him, I guess. I, I think uh, you're referring to the previous Governor Edwards, who, who's not not the father not of the, the current Governor oh, Edwards. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, the reason I'm calling is, is uh, it's an employment issue. I'm 62 years old, and I was hired to be a general manager of, of uh, CubeSmart uh, in Baton Rouge. And uh, in I got an apartment with it, which was right above the store. And the way the Cube Smart works is there's a general manager who's the senior person, and then there's a store manager who is, uh, uh, should we say, you know, All the right. next well, step down. Is there a question here, Tyler? Yeah. Well, the question is concerning employment. Money came up missing, uh, some of our deposits for the bank. And it was very clear that they were taken by the store manager. There was no break in or anything. All right, I, I, I don't know where he's going with this, Governor. And I, well, you've got I, a lot I, of people waiting. I, to I talk. don't either. Tyler, Sounds I, like a very sincere man. Though. He does, and and I appreciate the call. Uh, do stay on and talk to Micah. There might be something we can do for you. But but obviously, if money came up missing, um, uh, I would encourage you to talk to the police department uh, uh, or law enforcement where, wherever you you 
happened to be in, in Baton Rouge. I don't know whether it was inside or outside the city limits. But if you give some information to Michael, we, we will see if there's any way that we can help you. And is there any relation between you and the former governor? Yeah, there, it, it is possible, but it would be so distant, and I wouldn't be able to establish it, uh, to, to be honest with you. And, and of course, um, you know, my dad was, was a sheriff back when, when uh, the Governor Edwards was first elected governor. He did support uh, Edwin Edwards back in that 71 election. I think it was 71. Yes. Uh, and and uh, they, they were friends up until the time that my dad died a few years ago. Monica, uh, no, excuse me, this is uh, Jimmy in New Orleans. Hello, Jimmy. Good afternoon. You're on Ask the Governor. Hey, Mr. Governor. Thank you for doing this. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, so... Hi. So my question uh, pertains to, to the fact that today is the first day that recreational cannabis is illegal in Canada, the first G7 nation to do that. Uh, their Commerce Department expects over $2 billion in tax revenue from that. Um, and then more, more comparatively, the state of Colorado has had over $100 million in tax revenue uh, from recreational cannabis over the past couple of years. All right. Well, we got this question, it seems, once a show. We do, and, and uh, when I saw that Canada had done that, I anticipated the question. Jimmy, my answer really hasn't changed. Uh, I, I just don't support legalizing marijuana for recreational use uh, in, in Louisiana. Uh, as you know, we are moving forward because of bills that I supported while I was in the legislature and bills that I have signed into law as governor uh, to move forward with respect to medicinal, medicinal marijuana. Uh, and, and it looks like sometime in the first quarter of next year, those products will be available here uh, upon a prescription uh, from, from the doctors. Um, so that, that's just where I'm at. I, I think it's much wiser to see what impacts there are uh, in these areas that have moved forward, whether it's Colorado or, or elsewhere, uh, and learn from them. And, and not everything that generates a tax dollar is a worthy pursuit uh, in, in my opinion. And I know that reasonable people disagree about uh, the legalization of recreational marijuana. I just, I'm not there. I'm that, that's just not something that I support. Cheryl in Slidell. Hello, Cheryl. You're on the air with the Governor John Bell Edwards. Hi, Governor Edwards. How are you doing? Cheryl, I'm doing fine. Thank you very much, and I hope you are as well. I am, and I have to say that you were a scholar and a gentleman, and I am very glad you're a governor. Um, my question is, I'm a teacher in St. Tammany Parish, and Louisiana is one of nine states that does not give us our fair share of Social Security benefits. I worked, I started teaching later in life, and I am fully vested in Social Security and probably will work after I retire. So my question is, who do we, who do we speak to or what can we do to remedy this? I know a lot of educators who have the same issue, and it's causing us a lot of problems. Yeah, Cheryl, uh, thank you for the call. By the way, it's not just teachers, it's, it's uh, state workers as well. Um, and it's a decision that the state of Louisiana made decades ago not to opt into the Social Security mm -hmm. system. Um, and so they haven't paid uh, that, that portion of payroll uh, into the Social Security system. Uh, and, and so it would require an act of Congress. Uh, and if you look over the last uh, couple of decades, I think every Congress, they have at least one bill filed uh, that would change this, but, I, but the bills never make it through the process, and I can only assume that there is a huge price tag associated with that. Um, but my mother is a retired state employee. This is something that she has faced. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why we have to be very careful in Louisiana what we do to pension systems for state workers and teachers and, and, and support workers and, and so forth uh, because we anything that we do with the pension system has to be done uh, mindful uh, that there is not Social Security available uh, for, for our teachers and for, for other state workers. Uh, and, and I think that that means that we have to, we have to make sure that, that we confer a benefit upon retirement that preserves the security and dignity of teachers and, and state workers. Uh, and in fact, the, the contribution that we make as an employer uh, to the pension systems is actually per, per uh, member, whether it's a, a teacher or a state worker, is actually less than a contribution to Social Security for, for the uh, benefits that that particular worker will get. The normal cost of the, of the pension system is what they call that. And so, you know, Cheryl, I, I, it's, it's just one, I would encourage you to talk to uh, 
I would think your congressman is, in Slidell is probably going to be Steve Scalise, and you can talk to either of our two U.S. senators. That's where the bill has to be filed and moved through. Um, but it's it's unlikely to happen, and not through their fault. It, th- this is this is a situation that has been in existence for a long time. This is MJ in Baton Rouge. Uh, MJ, you're on the air with Governor Edwards. Thank you so much, Mr. Inkster, uh, and John. Appreciate your time on the air. Uh, so you spoke about your trip to Israel, and there is no doubt about how uh, involved Israel is in uh, cyber technologies, massive companies like Skype. And All right. What's your question, MJ? Uh, I, I was wondering if there's any chance you can incorporate any time into the Palestinian territories during your trip to get an idea firsthand of the condition of the people out there. Yeah, uh, MJ, thank you very much for calling in. I, I will tell you, just logistically speaking, uh, because of what would be required to coordinate a trip into the Palestinian territories uh, and the time that I have available on the ground, I know that, that that is not going to happen, at least on this trip. Um, and I, it would it would be my hope that I would go back at some point in the future to further explore uh, mutually beneficial trade opportunities and commercial opportunities for Israel and the state of Louisiana, and, and it may be something that we can do then. We only have a minute, so please uh, be brief. Bailey in New Orleans, you're on the air. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Hi, Bailey. Uh, thanks. Thanks for taking All right, my call. What's your question, Bailey? Um, I've got a question regarding the uh, exhibition hall tax that's collected by LDR. Okay. Um, All right. Go ahead quickly. There's been a, a wider net cast with regards to whom is responsible for collecting this tax. All right. Okay, uh, Bailey. Uh, we're running out of time. Give Micah your number. And your name, and I'm going to have uh, someone at uh, the Department of Revenue, probably Secretary Kimberly Robinson, give you a call to answer your question. Um, we, we're just running out of time, and, and I'm, we're not going to get through it otherwise. Thank you, Bailey, and uh, thanks for everybody for uh, calling and uh, participating and listening, of course. And we'll be back in four weeks, 28 days. The governor will have been to Israel. LSU will have played Alabama, and we will have uh, – a new Congress elected, so a lot will happen between now and then. And I'm looking forward to it. Jim, thank you so much, and thanks to all the listeners out there for tuning in again.